If you stay present, God will provide the preparation that you need for where you're going. He's training you. And now why is training important? Training is important whether you're on a job, whether you're on a team, whether you're a part of something greater than you, but skill development. Training is good for improved performance, efficiency, confidence, even increased capacity. Where are my athletes at? Right? Anybody who ever play a sport, you know how important training is. Put your hand down, ma'am. You did not play sports. <laughs> We're not going to lie in the house of God. So, so how many of you understand the importance of training and preparation and practice? Right? We're talking about practice. You watch game film. You uh, get out on the field. You do daily doubles. What, what else do you do? You, uh, you, you draw up plays and strategize before you ever step foot on the field. And in the same way where God is calling you, the game, the, the main stage where he's calling you right now is the training, is the preparation. He, right now he's trying to get you ready for where you're going. But many of us are missing it because we're too busy worried about tomorrow. We're too busy overthinking. We're too busy overanalyzing. We're not focusing on this moment, even right now as I'm speaking. Some of you are thinking about brunch. Where's the hot spot in LA to get brunch? Some of you are looking at your watch and thinking, man, he's already been on for 20 minutes and hasn't said a Bible verse. Many of you are thinking about football now that I mentioned sports. You're like, there's some good games on the NFL ticket. And as soon as I get out of here, I'm gonna go watch these games. Some of you are thinking about laundry and school and work and all of the things that you have to do because you lack the ability to be present. But right now, I believe that God is trying to prepare you in this present moment. Many of you are future tripping. Many of you are thinking about where am I going to live? Who am I going to marry? Where am I going to work? What am I going to do? These things aren't evil in and of themselves. They're not bad things. These are great questions for us to contemplate on from time to time. But uh, the, the, the idea here is that when you are gripped by them, when those control your waking thoughts, when you're consumed by what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to drink, where am I going to go, who am I going to be with, when these things start to overwhelm you is when you stop being present and you start being pulled in different directions. So if you're not present, you're most likely missing the lesson and the valuable preparation in the season that God has you in. So now I want to teach you guys what the Word of God says about this. Can I talk about this? Can I share what the Word of God says? Awesome. So one thing that I wanted to start doing is saying this. This is my Bible, and I'm going to stand behind it. I'm going to stand on it, and I'm going to stand for it. Meaning that everything that I say, this is going to go before me. So I'm behind my Word, and when things come up, I'm going to stand on it. And when things get difficult, I'm going to stand for this thing. Would you guys claim that with me this morning? Right? We're going to stand behind it. We're going to stand on it. And we're going to stand for it every time we open this scripture. So the word of God says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 40, uh, 34, I'm going to read this. We're going to double back and we're going to break it down. So it says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Ear note that for just a second. Do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? In another term, is like, who, who of you, through worry, can add another second to your life? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you little of faith? Verse 31 says, therefore, do not worry. It's the second time he says this. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Another way to look at Gentiles would be the world, or the unsaved, or the godless. So these are the things that the world goes after. They're constantly concerned and worried about these things. It says, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. We're going to underline and come back to knows. He knows that you need, we'll underline and come back, to need. 
Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, third time, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus says three times, do not worry. Say that with me on the count of three. One, two, three, do not worry. Okay, this isn't a suggestion. This is a command, and it's so important and so nice that he says it thrice. He says it three different times. Do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. Do not worry, amen? So it's gotta be important. Worry, let's look at the definition of what worry is. Worry is to allow one's mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. Anybody here struggle with worry? Constantly consumed by the things that aren't going well, the things that aren't going right, the things that don't meet your expectations. You're consumed and you allow, it's a choice that you make to let your mind drift and be filled with difficulty or troubles. Here's something that I found as I was breaking down the word worry. The root of worried is an old English word called worgen. All right, Worgen, W-Y-R-G-A-N. It's another word also known as strangle. So the root of the word worry actually is derived from the word strangle. And it wasn't until the late 1800s that worry was used to describe the feeling of anxiousness and focusing on being lost or your troubles. So for instance, they would say a dog worried a rabbit. He didn't just like scare the rabbit or make the rabbit feel a little unsettled. He would strangle the rabbit. So worried or worry was once known as strangle. So Jesus is sitting here saying, don't let life strangle you. Don't let the worries, the concerns, and the cares of life strangle the life out of you. Do any of you ever feel like life uh, or that worry is strangling the life out of you? Do any of you ever feel like your dreams are being constricted because you can't be present, you can't focus on the moment and what's right in front of you? Now, I want to talk about worry in just the natural sense, right? We have this spiritual aspect that we will talk about, but I want to talk about it in the physical. And I hope that we all know that chronic worry is dangerous. Do you guys all understand that? From just like a physical standpoint, we'll take the, the, the word of God, the truth, and we'll set this here for a second. Somebody who just worries a lot, that's a health issue. Do you guys understand that? A couple of things. There's a reduced quality of life. When you worry to a point uh, that, that is unhealthy, it becomes a drain on your mental and emotional energy. It makes it difficult for you to enjoy life. Has anybody ever heard of a worry wart? Somebody who's like constantly worried. How fun are they to be around? Like they're constantly scared. They're constantly concerned. Like it has uh, uh, the effect of reducing the quality of your life. Another one is impaired decision-making is when you are riddled by worry and you allow worry to strangle the life out of you, then you don't make decisions based on faith. You make decisions based on fear. So when you allow worry to consume you, again, your decision-making isn't the best. Another thing that worry does is it strains relationships. When you're constantly worried, we tend to isolate more and we tend to pull away. So if I'm constantly worried about what people are saying, what people are thinking, if I'm constantly worried or fearful that there's not gonna be enough or that I'm gonna be perceived this way or that way, we tend to isolate and pull away. These are just things in the natural that worry does. Uh, the, one of the other things is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So worrying excessively about negative outcomes inadvertently contributes to that coming into fruition. Your thoughts are powerful. What you think on and what you hold in front of you typically come to fruition. We're made in the image of God. And if the words that we speak and the thoughts that we think are powerful, then if we're constantly worrying and thinking about negative things, then we're bringing those things into our sphere of influence. One scripture that stands out is Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. It says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Perfect peace comes from staying our mind. Rather than staying our mind on our issues, our problems, our troubles, and our difficulties, we stay our mind on God. And in doing so, we are gifted this peace. Does that make sense? 
So you have no peace because you have your mind on your worries and your worries on your mind. You're constantly thinking about all of the wrong scenarios, how things will backfire, how they'll fall apart, how they're not going to meet your expectations. You're focused and centering your mind on the bad that can happen. And then lastly, negative health effects. We all know that worry can quite literally kill us. I'm going to give you guys a list. Physical health issues like high blood pressure, heart disease, weakened immune function, a couple of things that we know about worry. Who tends to worry more, men or women? Women tend to worry more. Uh, the American Psychological Association reports that about 77% of people regularly experience physical symptoms caused by stress. So if you're stressed and if you're worried, three out of four people are actually ex like experiencing it in their body. Your stress and your worry is strangling the life out of you and is quite literally killing you. Again, Jesus tells us not to worry for a reason. And lastly, uh, the Journal of Health Psychology found that high levels of worry were associated with a 20% higher risk of mortality. So if you chronically worry and are constantly focused on the negative, you are more likely to die sooner. Like, let that just sink in for a second. The Bible says do not worry for a reason because it's strangling the life out of you. So what's the solution? What is the solution to not worrying? Is it something that we need to come up with? I, I don't think so. I think that we look right to the scripture. In verse 33, it says this. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So Jesus is speaking. He's saying, hey, don't worry. You're worth more than flowers. You're worth more than birds. Those things are provided for. All you have to do is focus on him, is seek him first. And all of those other things are going to be taken care of. He says, seek, the, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and they'll be added to you. He says to seek first, then he adds. He says that we seek, and then he adds. Many of us have it backwards. Is that right? Most of us go after it. We try to exhaust all of our own resources. We chase after things. We run after things. We, 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 we worry. We stress. We get frustrated. We get discouraged. We try everything that we can in our power, and then we try to invite God into the situation. That's how many people operate is we try to solve the problem on our own, and then we invite God to try to help us fix what it is that we're going through. So the question is, how do we seek the kingdom of God first? The Bible says, hey, rather than worrying, seek first the kingdom of God. How do we do that? I think that it's simple. I think it's simpler than many of us make it. We make the things of God a priority over the things of the world. Amen. We make him and the things of heaven a priority over the things of of this world. A biblical example that I want to share with you guys is found in Mark chapter 14 verses 3 to through 9. So we're talking about how do you make the things of God a priority over the things of this world. I'm going to turn to my Bible in Mark 14 if you guys want to put that on your notes because it's not on the screen. Mark 14 verses 3 through 9. I want to just read this real quick. This is a story about uh, a lady who is unnamed at the moment but um, we know her as uh, Miss Mary. Verse 3, it says, And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, this is Jesus, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? So there's this picture of Jesus is here. A lady comes in and she spends like all of her money that is in this alabaster perfume or this oil and she breaks it over his head and anoints him with this. People are ticked about it. To be indignant means that you're annoyed or you're angered. So they're frustrated about this. And they say, why was this oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii. If you guys don't know, three, or 30 denarii, excuse me, or 300 denarii. 300 denarii is about $30,000. Okay, so this, like, this is some Chanel number no. five. This is some limited edition, expensive perfume. Like, it's a, it, there's only 55 bottles made. They come in, they, she breaks the bottle, pours it over them. They're like, wait a second, you just wasted 30K. Like, that is a year worth of wages. Why would you do that? That is an absolute waste. We could have sold it and gave it to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. She's doing something for God. She's doing something for the Lord. 
She's seeking first the kingdom of heaven, doing what's right in her eyes to honor her Lord and Savior, but the world doesn't see it that way. They don't see it the same way. They're looking after other things. They're thinking about their own benefit. They're thinking about how they can come up. They're thinking about how they can make a dollar, even though they're saying they're gonna give it to the poor, right? But Jesus said, verse six, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. You have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do good to them. So this is just an example of what it looks like to put the things of God, the things of heaven, before the things of this world. This doesn't mean that we should neglect our daily necessities, that we shouldn't neglect our daily duties or the things that we need to do to sustain our lives. But I want you to ask yourself these couple of questions. The first question is, where do you primarily spend your energy? Where do you spend the majority of your energy? And the second thing I want you to ask yourself is, all my time and money spent on goods and activities that will perish or in the service of God? Because where your money is, where your time is, where your resources are, reveals many times where your heart's at. So if you're spending your time, energy, effort, and resources in one thing, and it's not in the service of God, then it's just a place for you to step back and reflect and look and say, am I putting first the things of God or am I consumed by pursuing my own provision? The second thing is this, solution number two. In verse 32, it says your heavenly father knows that you need. He said he knows what you need. He knows that you need. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly father knows that you need all of these things. God knows what you need, and what you need isn't always what you want. Can I get an amen? Do you guys understand that? Some of the things that you want don't line up with God's plan, purpose, or will. Some of the things that you think that you need are so far out of alignment with what he has for you that you're jaded and that you're lost. The issue a lot of the times is that what we expect God to do and how we expect God to do it doesn't line up with the way that he's trying to do things. And so we get frustrated, we get discouraged, we get upset. We start to complain or maybe even accuse God of not loving us or forgetting about us or not hearing about our prayers or thinking that he turned his back on us, but that couldn't be further from the truth. When we understand that he knows what we need and he supplies it, we start to look at life through a different lens. We start to realize that maybe what I'm trying to do and accomplish doesn't line up with what God made me to do. And I think that a lot of us find ourselves in that. It's okay to have dreams and visions and goals, but when they contradict or they go against what God made you for, that's why you're filled with discouragement. That's why you're filled with sadness. You don't know who you are. You don't know why you were made, and you don't know whose you are. We need to get to this place of understanding that if you don't have it, you must not need it. Let me say that again. If you don't have it, you must not need it. So many of us think that we need this or we need that, that we get out of alignment and out of focus with his word and what he's calling us to do. It's not bad to have goals, visions, or dreams. Those are awesome. I love that for you. But in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, it says that man will plan his ways, but God will establish his steps. So what we're planning and desiring, we have dreams, we have visions, we have goals, but if where I'm going doesn't line up with God, I don't want it. I don't want to walk through a door that God didn't open. I don't want to join myself to something that God didn't ordain because there are such things as good opportunities that aren't God opportunities. And so I think a lot of you even now are wrestling with these choices and decisions that are good, they're healthy, they're lucrative, they might even lead to some level of success. It might be an open door, but are you willing to settle for a good thing when God's calling you this way? I don't want to do it if God didn't call me to it. I only want to walk in the places that God has illuminated the path, where God is holding my hand and taking me. We have to get back to the understanding that just because we want it doesn't mean that we need it. That is a, a place where it takes a, a certain level of spiritual maturity to realize that. When you truly understand this, you start to realize that many of the things that you want are no good or the reason behind wanting them are selfish or even prideful. And that's a hard reality to come to a grips with. Sometimes the things that we want are for our own selfish pride. Some of the things that we want are for our own gain. Some of the things that we want are because we're trying to build our little K kingdom and we're not focused on his capital K kingdom. 
And I've been guilty of that. I've been guilty of trying to posture or position myself because I wanted to build my platform or I wanted to build my name or I wanted to exalt myself. And on the other side of that is it always comes to ruin because you can never build anything on a, on a, on a solid foundation that's not Christ. Anything that's not built on him is sinking sand. It's not a matter of if it will collapse. It's only a matter of when. It's only a matter of when. Yeah. And so we have to just get to this understanding that he knows what you need. If you don't have it, you must not need it. I like to look at life in a series of, I have 24 hours. I have 24 hours. That's all I have. Tomorrow is not promised. I could leave these doors and be struck by lightning, and that's a wrap. I don't want to spend this 24 hours wishing, wanting, hoping, and just constantly dreaming about a future event that hasn't even taken place or have, hasn't even been promised to me. And that's where a lot of us live is that we're not taking advantage of the present moment. We're not taking advantage of the here and now because we're living so far in the future that we're missing what it is that God's trying to do for us. And if you pay attention, like I was sharing with my wife, I'm paying attention and realizing that he is preparing me in this present moment for what is to come, but most of you are missing the preparation because you're so concerned about tomorrow. So you're not able to grow. You're not training. You're not growing. You're not learning. You're not living. And then when you get to the place that God's called you, you're ill-equipped. You're ill-prepared. You don't have the things that you needed to be successful in that place because you were so busy living in the tomorrows. So we need to get back to understanding that if you don't have it, you must not need it. It's not a part of the plan, purpose, and will for this day. How can I do a better job of serving him in this moment right now? Amen. The third thing and the last thing I want to share is how staying present is a key to unlocking the preparation that he has for you in this season. When you start to worry and your mind starts to wander, I want to encourage you guys to do these five things. We're going to use, you know how pastors, we love to do stuff. Like I have the analogy save uh, that we like to, to share, right? Uh, share your testimony, attend a, a Bible-based community event, volunteer, or eat a meal with uh, somebody who's close to you and far from Jesus. So this one is going to be trust, all right? These are the five things, T-R-U-S-T, -S trust. When you start to worry and your mind starts to wander and you start to feel yourself getting like riddled with this anxiousness and this future trip, the first thing I want you to do is talk to God. I want you to talk to God in prayer. Seems like a no brainer, but you wouldn't be surprised how many people run to alternative sources, how many people run to drugs, run to alcohol, run to social media, run to pornography, run to a relationship. So many people are running to talk to everybody else except God, but he's the one who made you and knows exactly what you need. If you want to calm your mind, then we have to talk to God through prayer. The other thing, the R stands for read your scripture. Now, I'm not saying that you have to sit down and have an hour-long Bible study, but some of the things that have helped me in my journey with overthinking, overanalyzing, and worry has been marking some scripture that brings me back to the present moment. And one of them I shared with you has three reminders where it says, do not worry. So maybe somewhere in your notes on your iPhone, or maybe on a sticky pad, or maybe somewhere in your journal, you write two to three verses, a couple of verses that you can go to on a regular basis. I've prayed, I've talked to God, and now I'm running to the scripture to remind myself of what it says. It says, do not worry. It reminds me that I'm his. It reminds me that I'm kept. It reminds me that I'm chosen. It reminds me that he knows what I need. It reminds me that he provides for me. We run to the word. We said that we're going to stand behind it. We're going to stand on it. We're going to stand for it. And so we must run to it if we want to stay our mind and be reminded of who he is and who he says that we are. The you is unite with others, right? We are the body of Christ. You're not just the armpit of Christ. I know some of you might feel like just the armpit or the back of the kneecap or in between the toes, but we are the body, right? Some of y'all smell like the armpit of Christ, but no, I'm just kidding. That's a total bad joke. I was talking about myself. Look at the armpit of Christ up here. It's sweaty. I was thinking about myself, but 
we are called to unite and to be there for one another. How many of you guys have accountability partners? How many of you have somebody who you can reach out to? You wouldn't be surprised how many people are gonna leave this door without being connected, without having at least one person they can rely on, without having at least one phone number or somebody who they can connect with. We need to do a better job as believers, as walking out what it is to be the church, the capital C, to be the body of Christ. So unite with somebody. Hey, when I'm worried, I'm going to take it to prayer. I'm going to see what it says in the scripture. And I'm going to reach out to somebody who I trust and I know who I can talk to. You guys, why do you think counselors get paid so much money besides the fact that they're extremely qualified and have gone through a lot of school and can do things that I can't do besides all of that? Because sometimes people just need to know that they're heard. Sometimes they just need to, somebody to talk to. And people are willing to pay a lot of money to talk to people because they don't feel comfortable talking to other people. But we've been equipped in many cases, not all cases, because I love counseling and I'm a big proponent and uh, advocate for it. But I think that some things can be handled within the body. So unite with other people. The S, this has been uh, foundational for me. The S is sing, praise, and worship him. When you're in the middle of the storm, praise him. When you're at your rock bottom, praise him. When you're at the end of your rope, praise him. Sing praise and worship. Regardless of what you're going through, God deserves praise. Regardless of what you're going through, absolutely. Regardless of what you're going through, his nature doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You want to get your mind stayed on him, then remind yourself of how good he is. Remind yourself of how kind he is and merciful and fair and perfect and righteous. Worship and sing through the storm. I think that it's one of the most profound ways that we can turn our situation around. It might not change the circumstances, but it might change your heart. I can't tell you how many times I've been down and out and frustrated and feel like the world is just caving in on me and my shoulders are just weighed down by the weight of this world and I'll put a worship song on and it just changes the atmosphere. It reminds me of my God. It reminds me of the God that I serve. It reminds me of what Jesus did on the cross. It reminds me of the blood that he shed on my behalf. It reminds me that I'm chosen. And so when I'm riddled by worry and anxiousness and future tripping, I sing and worship him through that. And then the last one is thank him. I thank him. You know how hard it is to be grateful in the middle of <laughs> things not going well. You're going through a fight with your spouse and you're just like, thank you, God. It's like, that's hard. That is extremely hard. But again, if you're present and you understand what he's doing, you realize that he might be sharpening you. He might be refining you. He might be revealing to you areas where you're being selfish, where you're not being sacrificial, where you're not leading well. Many times, and what we like to do, this is going to be a side tangent, is that we like to point at everybody else and think that everybody else is the problem when many times you're the problem. And God's allowing those people to act like sandpaper in your life because he's trying to whittle away some of the rough edges of who you are. But what we do is we get so caught up saying, oh, well, they did this and they did this. And like, if you've got five people who are a problem in your life, you should probably look in the mirror. And like, if you guys understand what I'm saying, if there's something that keeps happening over and over and over, you might want to take a time out and reflect and say, maybe I'm the problem. Maybe that's me. But again, you thank him. You thank him for the argument. You thank him for the job that you just lost. You thank him for the situation that uh, happened with your health. Like this is one of the most challenging and hard things. And that's why I put it at the last T instead of the first T because it can be challenging. But it takes trust. It takes faith knowing that he wants what's best for you, that he made you for a purpose, that he knows what you need and he's gonna take care of you. So we thank him, we talk to him in prayer, we read your scripture, unite with others, you sing praise and worship him, and then you thank him. I wanna share just a quick thing that I went through this week. Um, man, if you guys follow on Coffee and Prayer, then you're probably up to speed, but I thought I was gonna die on Monday, like no joke. Um, I thought I was having a heart attack. I was having heart palpitations Monday night, and I felt like I was trying to pass mud through my heart. Like, you know, it's usually blood, but it felt like mud. It was like, blub, 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 and it was like locking up. Um, and I was like, well, it's been a good run. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm texting people stuff like, oh, man, 
you know, I love you. And <laughs> like, I'm starting to get my will and testament put together because I thought it was a wrap. We were, we were about to be done here. And, um, you know, I actually had a doctor's appointment scheduled for Wednesday that was scheduled way in advance. And uh, I go in there and the doctor's like, what's going on? And I just got the look of death. I'm just like, I think my heart's going to explode. And he's like, well, let's hook you up to an EKG. They do the testing and he's just like, no, nope, your heart is healthy. It looks good. You didn't have a stroke. You didn't have a heart attack. There's none of that. And he says, well, let's talk about your caffeine intake. And I was like, dang. He goes, well, what happened Monday? And I was like, well, I drank two cups of coffee. Then I took some pre-workout with some BCAAs. And then I didn't drink any water and I worked out. And he was like, sir, you were trying to pass the caffeine through your system. It wasn't, it had nothing to do with your heart. So I had one of these like come to Jesus moments where I was having to step back and reflect on the choices and the decisions that I was making in my life and how I was honoring my body and the temple that God gave me. Um, but it reminded me of something. And it just reminded me that when I'm at these back against the wall moments, when I'm at my rock bottoms, when I'm at the end of my rope, I tend to pursue God a little bit harder, right? I start to like really dive in. I'm like, Lord, you know, I'm on my knees and I'm like really pressing in. And it just reminded me and I had this thought of what is it gonna take for us to get that desperate for his presence without having to have our back against the wall in moments of pain. Like I want that hunger 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I want that desire every day. I, I don't wanna have to wait till I'm at the end of my rope. I don't wanna wait until I've got my heart about to beat out of my chest or some, I don't wanna only enter into prayer when I need something. I wanna get to this place where I am passionate and intimate and I'm pursuing his presence on a regular basis. Anybody else ever feel like that? I know that some of you probably do. You're in this place in this season and I've gone through seasons where I'm just pursuing and, and, and you know, diving in and leaning in and then there's seasons where I'm just kind of on autopilot and it was a great reminder that God brought me low for a moment to remind me of who I am and to remind me of whose I am. And that's where a lot of this message was birthed is uh, I was filled with worry and panic and anxiousness and all of the thoughts started going through my mind like, is this it? Is this a wrap? Is this, is, this, is this how it ends? Like, it's been a good run. I'm over here, like, I got a baby coming and oh, this is some people's story. It was a, it was a dark moment, but... Um, I just want to remind you that God knows what you need. Amen. He knows what you need. And so sometimes those rock bottom moments, sometimes those closed doors, sometimes those broken hearts, sometimes those empty pockets, sometimes those health scares are exactly what you need to be reminded of your reliance on him. And that, that, like, I just hope and pray and wish that we didn't have to get to that place, but we're like the Israelites, right? They've got bread coming from heaven. They've got water coming from a rock. They just watched the Red Sea part in front of them. And what, they're just like, man, the water's not sparkling. Uh, the manna's not gluten-free. Like, they're complaining about the provision and the miracles that they're witnessing in front of them. They're like, nah, you know, I just think I'm going to go back to Egypt. Like, you know, at least they had sparkling water. And, you know, like, it's like, What? But that's us, right? It's easy to look back and go, man, those Israelites, they're so crazy, but we do the same thing. We'll be on fire and passionate and excited about the persons of God and we're diving into his word and then a season will go by and then we barely even open our word. We're not pursuing, we're not excited. We're not entering into that intimate space with him. And so I just want to encourage you guys, let's be intentional about going deeper. Let's be intentional about being present. Let's be intentional about understanding that what you're going through is most likely preparation. And so lean into that and then be reminded that he is providing for you every step of the way. If you don't have it, you might just not need it for where he's taking you. So get rid of some of that baggage and let go of some of those things that you're so resistant to letting go of. Amen. Go ahead and stand with me. Band, if you guys would come up. I want to leave you guys with this thought. Francis Chan once said, worry implies that we don't quite trust that God is big enough, powerful enough, or loves us enough to care about what's happening in our lives. When you start to worry if God is going to supply or provide, then you're saying with your actions, not with your words, 
God might just not be big enough. Like he was good enough to rise from the dead three days. Like he was good enough to die for my sins. I believe that he walked on water, but I just don't think he's going to find me a helpmate. Oh, I just don't think he's going to be able to provide in this area of my life. I believe all of these things. I believe that Jonah was in the belly of a well for three days, but I don't believe that he can get me out of my circumstances. I want you guys to remind yourselves, look at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers in the field. Are they of not more value? Are you of not more value than they? Do you not think God is big enough, powerful enough, or loving enough? Psalms 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Would you guys bow your heads right now? If you're here today and you're gripped by fear, you are strangled by worry, and you want to lean into the promise that says if you seek him, he hears you. Do you want to seek him today? Are you here today strangled by guilt and worry and fear and overthinking? If you're here today and you're bound by anxiousness or future tripping, I want you to call on his name. I want you to stand on this promise. I want you to seek the Lord. If you're here and that's you today, I want you to raise your hand. If you would say, I want to seek the Lord. Today, I want to put my faith and my trust in you. No longer do I want to try things my way. No longer do I want to be gripped by fear and anxiousness and future tripping. No longer. Today, I want to seek your face. I know that you hear me and I know that you can deliver me from all my fears. If you raised your hand, I want you to pray with me. If you're here and you're saying, or here, I want you to pray with me right now, everybody. Father God, we want to thank you for the bold individuals who today are declaring no more will they be riddled by fear. No more will they be strangled by worry. I want to lift up those who were bold enough and courageous enough to publicly declare that, you know what, I am done with worry. I am casting my cares and my burdens at the foot of the Lord, and I am trusting that he will provide and supply everything that I need. Heavenly Father, we lay down our wants, our desires, our visions, our goals. We pray that you would breathe life into them. God, if it's not from you, we don't want it. If it's not a door that you've opened, we don't want to walk through it. God, we lay down all of the overthinking, the overanalyzing, all of the questions and thoughts that don't come from you. We lay them down. God, we know that you do not come with a spirit of confusion. You are not here trying to trick us on a, on a test. You are here because you love us and you care about us. And so, God, we surrender in this moment. We are asking that you would have your way with us, have your way in our situation, God. We reveal to you the deepest, darkest places in our heart. We invite your light to search us, God. Reveal to us the areas that you would have us prune and audit and let go. We want nothing more than to live a life that is pleasing to you, a life that is in relationship with you, God. As we leave this place, help us to see who we are, the righteousness and perfection of Jesus covered by the blood. Help us to see that we are chosen. Help us to see that we are above and not below, God. Help us to see that we are the head and not the tail. Help us to see that we are more than conquerors, that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Help us to walk away knowing that the power in us is greater than the power in this world, God. Don't let us go from this place without changing us and transforming us, Lord. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you would move in this place Holy Spirit move in this place God we love you and honor you and praise you and we pray that this word would not return void but that you would write it on our heart and that we would live according to your word in Jesus name we pray amen let's worship God you guys give God praise thank you for watching I just wanted to remind you guys that when you tithe donate and contribute you're partnering with us in preaching the gospel and spreading the love of Jesus around the world so thank you Before you go, make sure that you guys subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications. You don't want to miss any videos that we're putting out. And lastly, do me a favor, share this video with at least one friend. You never know who might need to hear it. So if nobody's told you today, just know this, that we love you and God does too.